got it. <laughs> what are we what are we looking at today? Um, so the agenda, we're going to have a quick introduction to today's speakers, then have our first speaker and then have a look at uh, net zero strategy and different types of uh, carbon projects and carbon credits. Then we will have uh, our next speakers uh, and finished uh, with our, our final guest speaker. And at the very end, we will have a Q&A and take all of the questions that you will have for our uh, webinar today. So in terms of the speakers, I'm Luke. I'm the head of growth here at the Green Branch. Um, the Green Branch, we are a certified B Corporation, uh, also with the additional certification of best for the world in terms of environment or best of the environment. Um, and we're joined by Dan, who is um, from B Lab Benelux and the B Corp community. And we're super proud to be part of the B Corp ecosystem and really wanted to invite Dan along um, in terms of our audience who might want to know, want to know more about uh, what B Corp is, but also understand B Corp and B Lab's position on the voluntary carbon market. Um, so really grateful to have Dan as our guest speaker today. Uh, and on top of that, um, Miriam from the Green Branch, who is our forest carbon specialist, as well as Jacob, um, one of our co-founders, will be speaking as well. So as I mentioned, we've invited Dan to come speak to us about the B Corp movement. So I'm going to pass over to Dan to begin with to give a bit of an introduction to B Corp. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Luke, and thanks uh, for being here. It's uh, great uh, to see a B Corp of our, uh, within our Benelux B Corp community uh, enlighten uh, our audiences with uh, well, more in-depth knowledge. And today uh, it's also about, uh, about the B Corp movement, so therefore I would love to share a few things with you to all understand uh, what B Lab is, uh, what the B Corp certification entails, uh, and what you as a company could do to take action to improve uh, your impact. Uh, so, I'm aware that most of you already know uh, well, quite something about B Corp, so that's why I will keep it rather short. But if we go to the next slide, I would just love to quickly highlight uh, that we are all very much aware of all the challenges we are currently facing. So we're facing a climate crisis, a biodiversity crisis, uh, we're seeing uh, human rights abuses in our supply chain. And uh, on the other side, we're also throwing away one third of our food, whilst um, around 2 billion people are suffering from a, young, a hunger and malnutrition. In short, our economic system is broken, could be said. And that's exactly why, why BLAP is out there. And if we maybe press enter once again, uh, we see our lovely mission uh, as BLAP is a nonprofit organization that wants to change the economic system. What we want to do is move from a shareholder economy to a stakeholder economy. So we want to move from benefiting only shareholders to benefiting all. So what we do is we transform the global economy to benefit all people, communities, and the planet. For that, we create standards, policies, tools, and programs that shift the behavior, culture, and structure of business. Uh, for that, we mobilize the global B Corp community towards collective action to address society's most critical challenges, and we collaborate with governments, academia, coalitions, and other institutions to drive economic systems change. And you all know us from, uh, from uh, the certification work we do, but as said, we do much more. We also do lobby work at the EU level, for example, and, uh, and many, many interesting campaigns, to just uh, mention a few. But what does B Corp certification actually entail? So what does set it apart from other certifications? And uh, what does it take to get B Corp certified? First of all, uh, B Corp had to adhere to high uh, uh, standards in terms of uh, environmental and uh, social performance. Uh, so in short, a comprehensive impact analysis. Secondly, they have to change their statutes uh, or their associate, uh, articles of association, better said, and lock the mission, uh, lock their purpose into uh, their legal structure, so to say. Uh, this is a very clear and very strict uh, requirement, uh, which is also uh, a reason why uh, not all companies want or dare to take uh, that step, as it's really a commitment. Thirdly, B Corps in a community join a global movement of uh, B Corps who want to use uh, their business as a force for good. So it's not only focusing on your own individual impact, but also focusing on the collective impact. And last but not least, B Corps are uh, obliged to recertify once, uh, uh, recertify every three years uh, and embed that kind of way of uh, doing continuous improvement in their way of doing business. And if we then look at, uh, at the next slide, uh, 
we see uh, yeah what our BIA so our business impact and uh, uh, tool looks like. What we do is we measure what matters. Uh, so the B Corp impact assessment looks at success beyond profits. It measures your company's impact across five areas uh, in terms of governance, workers, environment, community, and customers. And the company can self-assess for the threshold of 80 out of 200 points. And if it achieves these points, it can then decide to go for formal certification for which B Lab starts a very extensive purification process. You might be asking yourself, why on earth would I start doing this? This takes so much work, it takes so much time, it takes an, uh, so much resources. Uh, but if we then look at the next slide, you'll understand why. First of all, to improve your impact. It's a great tool to, uh, to measure, manage and improve your impact and make your business future proof. Secondly, it helps build relationships. Thirdly, it helps you uh, to position your company uh, as being part of a leading movement. Uh, uh, fourthly, I would love to elaborate on uh, the fact that it helps attracting and engaging uh, talent. Uh, and uh, let's also not forget the way how it differentiates uh, your company from competitors. And last but not least, how it helps to embed and lock your mission uh, and protect it over time. Just to give you an overview of what a community looks like today, I would love to go to the next slide where you can see an overview of uh, the already more than 6,100 B Corps in our global community. You probably recognize a few of them. And if you go to the next slide, we see more Benelux focused companies, uh, including Tone Chocoloni, Rituals, uh, The Body Shop, Ace and Tate, Alpen Patagonia, Retransfer, Triodos Bank and the Green Branch. And that's the reason why I'm also speaking here because uh, yeah, Green Branch is a, a lovely member or uh, uh, player within our Benelux community. So that's uh, what I wanted to, to tell uh, today about, uh, about B Corp and the certification, but I would love to chip in later on to also give B Lab's position uh, on, uh, yeah, on the voluntary, voluntary carbon market. Thank you all. Let's uh, switch okay. back to Luke. <laughs> well, thank you for your very kind words about the Green Bunch. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think <clears throat> very similarly to, to Dan in terms of where we position ourselves, we, we, we focus on restoring ecosystems. And if you look at what's going on around the world, so for example, the in, in intergovernmental panel for climate and community has highlighted that conserving and restoring natural spaces is essential for limiting carbon emissions, providing one third of the mitigation effort needed in the next decade. But also if you go back to the Paris Agreement of 2015, we want to keep emissions below two, two degrees or at least to, to 1.5 or within 1.5. But as Dan said in his previous slide, we're really not on scope to achieve that. Um, and recently uh, the UN Envir Environment Programme um, released a, a report named The Closing Window which highlighted that we're not on course to achieve the 1.5 degrees and that actually at the moment our trajectory is about 2.8 degrees and that only an urgent system-wide transformation can deliver the enormous cuts needed to limit greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. And yes, as I mentioned, they've called it the closing window. But we at the Green Branch have a little bit more optimism uh, and we really want to work to keep the window open and keep that window of opportunity alive. And there are two um, spheres within business that we think are very, very important uh, and where we concentrate our efforts on in terms of net zero strategy and also nature based solutions. And we're going to talk a little bit more about those during this webinar today. But in terms of net zero strategy, um, it's really important that there are very clear guidelines and steps out there to follow to achieve net zero as an organization. And the first step starts with really understanding what your carbon footprint is. So it's really important in terms of when you're looking at your strategy, that you need to measure your scopes one, two, and three emissions. So you know what they are, then you can create targets as to what you want to get to in terms of a decarbonization strategy. And that decarbonization strategy will include eliminating emissions through design. So designing products or having a service that emits less of a CO2 footprint, reducing through efficiency and substituting through alternatives, maybe using renewable energy, for example. But there is a fifth layer, which is compensating. So there will be 
um, not the technology out there in order to go to, to zero. And that's where compensation and the use of carbon credits comes in, and we think plays a very important part of going above and beyond supply chain mitigation. Um, so to, to go into that in a little bit more detail, so <clears throat> this slide highlights what's happening or what we'd like to happen or what we suggest should happen at a company level. So you've got your company operations, you measure your CO2, you decarbonize, but then going this above supply chain mitigation, you can finance and support nature-based projects and you can compensate your carbon footprint. And so from us, we are the Green Branch, we are a project developer of nature-based solutions. So what we do simultaneously and what we want to happen at the same time is that we identify degraded areas for sustainable restoration. We develop and implement planting design with the local community. We measure and capture carbon. And this is certified uh, by a third party, which I'll talk about in, in, in less detail. But so that creates one certified carbon credit, which equals 1000 kilograms of CO2. And so there's different types of carbon mitigation projects, um, and these can be put into avoidance and reduction carbon credits and removal carbon credits. So avoidance and reduction, essentially, this is where you'd be stopping um, carbon, CO2 from being emitted uh, in, in, into the atmosphere. Um, and you have nature-based solutions and technical solutions. So an example of a nature-based solutions would be a red plus project. And this stands for reducing emissions from deforestation um, and forest degradation. And then you have technical solutions um, from renewables or cook stoves or, or clean water. And then you have removal. This is where you really are capturing and you're taking CO2 away from the atmosphere. And again, there's nature-based solutions and technical solutions. So from a nature-based solutions perspective, you've got afforestation, so ARR, afforestation, reforestation, and revegetation, and IFM, improved forest management, and blue carbon, which is carbon in coastal and marine ecosystems. So if we move on to the next slide, um, and as we highlight the key carbon credits are key to achieving net zero commitment. So we've got different types of examples of decarbonization strategy. So on the very far left, you've got decarbonization. So this is an organization that over time is decarbonizing its efforts, but there's no offsetting and there's no, there's, there's no additional efforts that are being made here. Whereas if you look at the next part, that's carbon neutral. That's where the organization is decarbonizing over time and through a mix of reduction credits and removal credits is becoming carbon neutral. The net zero example is almost the same, but is only offsetting their emissions from a removal perspective. And then climate positive is where you are actually removing and, and investing more in the removal credits than you are actually emitting. That would be defined as, as climate positive. And I think <clears throat> it would be naive here not to, to highlight some of the, the pitfalls and, and some of the biggest criticisms of the voluntary carbon market is this idea that it allows organizations to continue to emit and not have any decarbonization strategy. But you'll notice that none of our examples here are static. You know, we strongly believe that organizations must decarbonize and you can't just measure and offset exactly what it is. It has to be a, prog a progressional movement and that's what we stand for and that's what we want to promote within the voluntary carbon market. Um, as I mentioned, we are a project developer of nature-based solutions, and one of our projects is in the south of Brazil, um, near Porto Alegre. Um, this was an area that was completely previously deforested um, for uh, cattle ranching, uh, and we have a project that we are bringing it back to its original forestry state, um, and we have under 3,000 hectares under sustainable management, and we are contributing to five different SDG goals. Um, but the project is also certified um, by VERA, which is an organization which certifies different projects um, within the voluntary carbon market. Uh, so we have VCS uh, certification, as well as climate community and biodiversity, which is CCB. Um, and so this, this slide highlights a little bit about what we're doing. So the objective over the course of the project is to um, reach 10,000 hectares of afforestation and that that will sequester just under 4 million tonnes of CO2 and almost 7.3 million trees will be planted. But this is very sort of what I've just highlighted there is quite carbon focused. But for us, as I mentioned at the very beginning, we want to focus on 
holistic ecosystem restoration. So there are other benefits that we are implementing. So we will be planting 29 different species, species which will um, give habitat for over 20 different native animal, animal species. Um, we are creating um, jobs uh, for 250 employees, which will equate to 17,500 working days. And we invite um, universities and students from, from the local area to be able to study and understand our, our, our project in, in more detail. But to talk about that in a bit more detail and go into depth into what it really takes to develop um, a project um, and, and develop a project that really takes this holistic view, uh, we've got Miriam here. Um, so Miriam, I've had the pleasure of uh, working alongside you and seeing what you get up to um, in on one of our projects in Brazil. But I would love you to maybe talk to our audience a little bit uh, and give them maybe a, a typical day in the life of, of, of Miriam. Hi, everybody. And uh, thanks, Luke. Um, I think I will tell you about my best day that I had in the past year first, uh, as it just happened two weeks ago. We were in Brazil on project site and we were doing forest inventory, which means that we were measuring uh, diameter, height of trees, determining tree species. Um, and it was just incredible to see yeah, the beauty of nature over there um, with all its diversity, but also that we can actually trust nature that under the right conditions and with a little bit of help, uh, yeah, forests will grow back super fast. So that was just super nice for me also to see uh, and to experience. Um, yeah, but to tell you a bit of but a more average day uh, in my life is uh, that I'm working on uh, different certification documents um, for the, the uh, verified carbon started standard and CCB certification that you already mentioned, um, and also having meetings with, uh, for example, forest consultants or university professors to help us in the planting design um, and doing a lot of research on the forest types and species that we're planting. <laughs> very very interesting and um Miriam I mean on paper it, it feels that nature-based solutions um are, are great or a no-brainer why do you think they might have received some criticism or could you maybe talk, touch on that I think that it has to do a lot with the carbon tunnel vision um what I mean with that is that carbon credits are oftentimes just handled as another commodity um, without looking at, at the other impacts that carbon projects um, can have besides the carbon sequestration itself. Um, so I think it's essential for us as project developers to really see the carbon market as a restoration mechanism uh, rather than just producing as many tradable carbon credits as possible. Um, because we can have considered positive impact, uh, not only on the global climate, but also on the local level, on biodiversity, on communities on the ground that are directly affected by our projects. Um, so to come back to the first part of your questions, I really think that nature-based solutions are a no-brainer. They are a great solution. It's just about how we um, implement, design, and manage our projects. Okay, clear. And, and... I kind of mentioned a little bit, or I sort of touched on, on some of the community benefits and some of the biodiversity benefits that, that we're doing as a project developer. How do you go about ensuring that they can be they can be done? Or what do you do to ensure that you've got this holistic project that isn't just about carbon? Um, yeah, so you just said it. Do not <laughs> focus on only carbon sequestration and uh, how you can design a project uh, to, to have the biggest biomass growth uh, possible. But really, uh, I think the, the first step and also the most important one is to consider uh, the, sp the specific conditions that your project um, is located in. So the area, the, the native ecosystems, um, you really need to understand that to, to design the project in the way that the, the local native flora and fauna can benefit from your project. Um, so this means, for example, selecting uh, the best fitting native tree species, um, making a sustainable implementation and management design. Um, that's just key for the, for the biodiversity impact, um, I would say. And of course, carbon sequestration is part of that, um, but you should, you should see it in a, in a bigger, a bit of a broader sense. Um, and then in terms of um, community, um, try to engage with everybody who's possibly affected. So uh, individuals, but also organizations from an early stage onwards. Um, if you uh, integrate them throughout the, the project development process, um, then you can already uh, mitigate risks uh, before they even happen. Um, and you can 
most most likely achieve uh, positive impacts then yeah and so that's that's quite from a sort of project development perspective some of the audience here will be thinking maybe about buying carbon credits what, what advice could you could you be giving to, to, to that particular audience in, in looking for projects that really have this holistic impact um so with the certification that we follow the the verified carbon standard and the climate community and biodiversity standards of vera you can already get a lot of information um, of the different projects online um, so for each project, uh, there is a project design document, uh, there is monitoring documents and all kinds of other certification documents published in the VERA registry. Um, and I have to admit, it can be quite overwhelming at first glance. Uh, this is also why we at the Green Branch um, offer that service of checking quality um, of other projects for our clients. Um, but to answer your question, I would say that the CCP certification is already a good indicator for higher quality projects uh, because then project developers already have to uh, define indicators and also monitor them throughout the project lifetime in terms of their uh, community and biodiversity impacts. Um, and I can also give you some more detailed information from an afforestation and reforestation project type perspective. Uh, so what we are also checking is the type of species planted, um, if they're native or non-native, um, and whether it, they're planted in a monoculture uh, site or not. Um, because there is a lot of projects out there um, that are monocultures with non-native tree species, such as eucalyptus. Um, and for that, the, yeah, the positive impacts on biodiversity are quite limited. Um, so I would really look for projects that are planting uh, a diverse set of native tree species. Um, and then of course, also topics such as additionality and permanence are key for, for good project quality. So um, I, I've attended a few webinars about, about the voluntary carbon market and I, I often hear these words, additionality, uh, permanence, what, what, what do they mean? Um, so additionality means uh, that the project activities would not happen without the carbon finance. Um, so I can give you an example. Um, for example, the area is currently a, a degraded cattle ranch. Without the afforestation and reforestation projects, there will be no forest growing there because cattle ranching has a long history and a big market for mi milk and beef, but there is no such business model for rewilding projects as we are doing them. So people would not grow native forests without the revenue of the carbon credits. And then you also asked about permanence. Um, okay. Permanence is about the lasting impact of the project. Um, so therefore you can, for example, check if the forest is already designed kind of in a way to be harvested eventually, or yeah, to be well prepared for harvesting. Um, as I already mentioned, the monocultures uh, of non-native tree species. So eucalyptus timber, for example, has a big market in Brazil in the pulp and paper industry. So the likelihood of those, uh, those areas being harvested eventually after the product, project crediting period is higher than in a mixed native uh, native species forest. Okay, and um, maybe a personal question. Like, so you you've highlighted that the green branch can help organisations uh, find you know high quality projects or find the right project for them. Um, on a personal note, in terms of your experience on the ground, how do you feel that your experience helps you um, sort of guide customers or, or, or help with that part of high quality credits? Let's say. Yeah, I think because we're a project developer covering everything from A to Z. So we're doing acquisition, the project design, the implementation, as well as the monitoring and management. So we're, we have the broad knowledge from, from that. We know pretty well which risks and, and benefits such projects can have. Um, and also being in the field ourselves um, and talking to the people who are affected by, by the projects helps a lot to, to get an understanding for that. Um, yeah, and of course, as we're also undergoing the certification process, we know very well what the what the critical points are are in terms of that. Okay, and um, last question, bit of a holistic overview. What you know, what potential uh, do you see with, with nature based solutions? What potential do you see in this mechanism to to, to fight climate change? Um, so I don't think the carbon offsetting is the silver bullet to solve climate change. Um, and I would like to refer to the, the carbon emission mitigation hierarchy that you mentioned before. Um, I think it's really the uh, approach, uh, the sorry, the combined approach that is key 
Uh, so, of course, we have to measure and reduce uh, and optimize our processes to, to cut carbon emissions. But I think we should do it together with the offsetting. Um, Nature-based solutions by themselves will not solve the poly crisis we're in, but they can contribute to, to fight uh, global climate change. And as I already mentioned, they also can have a considerable, considerable uh, positive impact on biodiversity and communities on the ground. Thank you so much, Miriam, for, for joining us and, and sharing that really interesting insight. And to our audience, um, please remember that we've got this uh, chat function. And so if you've got any questions, please just throw them in the chat and then we will take some of your questions at, at the end. Um, so I can Thanks, Luke. Now. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> so Jacob, hello. hello. Uh, thank you again for, for joining us. Um, so you're one of the co-founders at the Green Branch. Can you maybe introduce why you started the Green Branch and what your vision was? Yeah, definitely. So uh, good to see all this face in this webinar. Um, so I met Casper Kupmer, my co-founder, during studies at the University of Rotterdam. Um, and we found about the enormous climate crisis that we're in and we wanted to do something about this. So we started looking into solutions to, to solve these problems. And there were a lot of technical solutions that we see coming up uh, currently. That's very good. But we were more fascinated about uh, nature-based solutions. And um, planting trees was one of them. And it sounds well, fun uh, to do, but also something that was needed. So we started to look into uh, into this market, how, how are these uh, projects financed and how do they work? And what we found out is that there was no real business model behind it. It was uh, most of the projects were running on donations, on NGOs, which is, of course, very good. But what we learned in our studies is that if you want to do something at scale, you need to have like a healthy business model. It has to be a business model for 30 years, which Miriam was also explaining. And um, during this, this deep dive into, into nature-based solutions, we found about the voluntary carbon market. And this really excited us because here, two things came together. At the one hand, the tool to finance these projects. And at, at the other hand, also a tool for companies to start, well, take responsibility for the negative impact on, on planet Earth. So when we found out about this, it was uh, for us very exciting. And we started drafting a, a pitch deck. I wanted to go to, um, to people to believe in our story. And, uh, on a very early stage, we found two investors that believed in this story as well. Uh, they wanted to do something uh, with their next phase of career, and uh, they really believed in, in the story of the Green Branch. Uh, but one thing that they said from the beginning is, if you're really serious about planting trees, if you're really serious about doing these kind of projects, you should go there. You should have the understanding of what it takes to, to do something on the ground there. So, uh, well, they didn't have to say it two times. We, we, uh, we went there. and. Uh, I think we, we we had some some luck over time. We we were in touch with a landowner that was interesting in in uh, in, in doing such a project. And um, well, after a year, our first tree. This is the picture as well, uh, where we planted our first tree. And um, yeah, so this is actually how how the green bay started. I think fast way forward, you already explained. We have now have three uh, thousand hectares under management, um, and there's a lot of things in the pipeline. We have a very good understanding of uh, how good product. Uh, quality project works um, so yeah exciting well thank you and and Jacob you, you briefly touched on, on the, the element of the voluntary carbon market being a mechanism for organizations to take action at the moment where do you see like what are the requirements that organizations have in, in present day business right now yeah, so I think that, that's very difficult. If, when we started to, uh, the Green Bridge, we were also looking to directives. How, how do you design a sustainable company? But at this point of time, companies only have to report on their financial performance. And I think what, what Dan said in the beginning, we should move away from a, from a shareholder, uh, shareholder company to a stakeholder company because it's, there's so many much more to do than only uh, getting the financial returns. So um, yeah, at this moment, there's not very much regulations that, that do so, but um, yeah, B Corp, for example, helped us a lot uh, in the beginning. We, we were B Corp, pending B Corp from the beginning, but it gives us a toolbox how to, to design such a company. And do you, do you see any initiatives coming up in, in the future or any change that, that will kind of direct organizations to, to take more action? Yeah, there, there's a lot. I think, I think uh, voluntary, there's, there's happening a lot. Uh, you see where we see that, that consumers are asking for it from, from, from companies. Uh, and also stay, uh, a lot of more uh, uh, people want to be B Corp or follow these guidelines, but also on a, on a, on a government level, there's, uh, there's things happening. I think one of the most exciting th things is the, cost, is the 
uh, corporate sustainability reporting directive that is just announced by uh, by the UN by the EU, and also these similar regulations are coming up in 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 America where companies have to start reporting on something more than only financial reports. So, what is your impact on on, on biodiversity? What's your impact on, on climate and and people? Um, and this this is just the beginning. This will become more and more over time. Uh, so yeah, I see positive change here definitely. And in, in terms of positive change, and we, we've sort of touched upon this in this webinar in terms of a good net zero strategy, how do you how do you see that or what recommendations can you give to, to those that are watching today and, and thinking about what their net zero strategy should be? Yeah, so I think every every co uh, company has a different net zero journey and also responsibility towards well, offsetting but their net zero st strategy. Uh, and I think what, what this uh, already mentioned twice this this webinar is that we should should start with calculating the footprint know what you're emitting uh, and start reducing as fast as you can but where i want to add is also we should also start calculating with cost for carbon also start offsetting as much as you can from day one uh we speak, we talk to a lot of companies that say well yeah first we're gonna calculate and then we're gonna reduce and then we're gonna offset after that but that's i think you're, then you're hiding besides this narrative you should do as much as we can because we're in a crisis um and i think um yeah so the responsibility part is something different so calculating and making a strategy to get to net zero is, is a company's responsibility um but some companies have a high emission per car per euro earned and they have to invest a lot in the in reducing their emissions more than uh, for example a software company that's with some small changes can reduce uh, uh where they can and then uh, don't have to do too much anymore and that's the responsibility when do you start offsetting what and i think that every company has to understand that we're in a problem and that you have to do as much as you can so um yeah you should you should invest in, in high quality na uh, nature-based solutions and offset projects um uh, yeah from the from the beginning i i totally agree with that and, and i think to touch upon that in terms of investing as you sort of mentioned you know i think the voluntary carbon market can also be you be used as an incentive to decarbonize more you know the more you decarbonize the less voluntary carbon carbon credits that you would have to invest in so i think that's that's really true and last i, I asked uh, miriam a big holistic question before i finish so one for you um the green branch is three and a half years old what's the future for the green branch or what's what's yeah what's your vision your future vision for for, for where we're going <laughs> you know what the end the webinar i look <laughs> now uh i will keep it short but i think it's uh super exciting what you have done in three and a half years and uh where when we started there was there was only questions yeah why should we offset and, and uh, what is the offset worth it and there's a tremendous change already in the past three and a half years so it excites me a lot to think about the future what will come up uh, i think that we are in a great position uh with a very good understanding of how projects work so at the one end we will uh work a lot on, on expanding our current project, but also uh, new projects in Brazil. And that's the other end also help uh, uh, clients and corporates, well, uh, getting their net zero strategies. Um, so I think that's, uh, that's uh, in a nutshell. Brilliant. Well, thank you, Jacob. And yeah, stick around for, um, I've seen some questions come in, so stick around and we'll, we'll ask you a few more questions, but I want to pass across to, back to Dan now, um, for, a, for an understanding of B-Lab's position on the voluntary carbon market. So I'll pass it back to you, Dan. Super. Thank you so much. Uh, of course. So um, as you all know, B-Lab from, uh, the, as a certification body, we also have a clear vision on the voluntary carbon market and, uh, and offsetting in that regard. So if we then look uh, at the next slide, I would love to give an overview of the challenge which we currently face in our global system. Because while voluntary purchases of carbon credits by companies can play a role in supporting faster emission reductions and delivering of the uh, SCGs, a system to define and ensure standards for both the integrity of the credits themselves and how companies can claim them is not uh, currently uh, yet uh, in place in a good manner. So as a result, uh, too many companies are currently engaging in a voluntary market where low prices and a lack of clear guidelines uh, risk delaying the urgent near-term emission reductions, which are totally needed to avoid the worst impacts of uh, climate change, as you all know. But luckily, uh, the Integrity Council for the Voluntary Carbon Market, 
which can be abbreviated by ICVCM. I mean, don't even start uh, knowing that uh, on top of your head, but uh, it's good to, to know that. Uh, they are currently working to define a transparent high integrity standard for measuring and assigning the greenhouse gas equivalent credits that can be claimed. Besides, I also want to mention uh, that the important work of intensifying, um, recognizing and rewarding high integrity companies who purchase and retire carbon credits to go further and faster in their climate action is being shaped by the Voluntary and Carbon Market Integrity Initiative. So another abbreviation, uh, which can be uh, actually uh, mentioned like VCMI. The same holds true for the SPTI uh, guidelines, of course. In short, a transparent, high integrity framework is needed to ensure credits are only used once a company's own mitigation efforts are in line uh, with science. And in that regard, I wanted to share our perspective on the voluntary carbon market. So if we then go to the next slide, we see how we as B-Lab look at the voluntary carbon market and what we advise you to take into account when setting your own business up and setting your own strategy up uh, for success. So first and foremost, companies should work on decarbonization, as we have all already stressed uh, during this webinar. So companies should follow science to establish their greenhouse gas uh, reduction targets. Secondly, companies' climate transition plans should consider, here comes a rather technical term now, uh, consider beyond value chain mitigation action, which is a term which has been coined by the SPTI initiative, or broadly actions uh, for the wider society. So this could also be linked to climate justice, for example, uh, and can be, but does not necessarily need to be in the form uh, of carbon credits. Therefore, supporting high integrity carbon credits as a beyond value chain mitigation action is definitely a, a good way to go. So it's accepted, uh, but cred uh, credits cannot be counted towards a company's entering uh, emission, uh, emissions reduction. So that is really key in that essence. Do not count it towards a company's interim emissions reduction. So here again, it's good to know that depending on the context of the company, there can be also other actions uh, which are uh, positive for wider society, such as contributing to the economic development of regions where companies uh, are operating uh, or including uh, just transition elements uh, like skills development for vulnerable communities, uh, for example. Once the company's net zero target is achieved, well done, uh, we should all uh, get there. It can use voluntary carbon credits for permanent removals to counterbalance uh, residual emissions. So it's important to know that companies do not have to use offsets for the res residual emissions. Uh, they can do uh, as well uh, other investments in, uh, in removals too. So if credits are used, uh, they should be high integrity. So that's uh, extremely important because uh, there are so many cre uh, credits out there. They should all be high integrity. Then, of course, the question rises then, what is high integrity? What are high integrity credits? So in SPTI, uh, the, and also in the latest ISO net zero uh, guidance and the latest UN high level expert group recommendations, uh, there's a guidance for that. So I all invite you to take a look at them. It's super interesting. Read through them, read through those recommendations, uh, read through the general uh, takeaways. Uh, and in, in this regard, I wanted to elevate one aspect, which is that credits should be governed inclusively through participation and consultation of experts and the people and groups impacted by them, and particularly indigenous peoples, local communities and vulnerable groups. Uh, such as women, children, uh, elderly people, uh, and people with disabilities. And when talking about carbon removals, it can indeed be in the form of nature-based solutions, uh, geological uh, or hybrid. So if done right, uh, nature-based solutions is considered uh, as a way to address both the climate and the biodiversity crisis. So it's literally... Uh, two things in, in, in one go. And this was also a, a big topic at the, cur at the um, uh, recent uh, COP27. So nature-based solutions can have the advantage to contribute to both adaptation and mitigation. Uh, and uh, nature-based solutions are especially critical for the forest land and the agriculture sectors, uh, of course. 
And if we then go to the next slide, uh, you see uh, something which I wanted to highlight, uh, because last but not least, when talking about uh, nature-based solutions, uh, I want to highlight this quote from WWF, which says it all for me. Uh, meaning indigenous people, uh, peoples and local communities have used nature-based solutions for millennia. So it is crucial that all solutions are people-centered, led by communities and draw from traditional and local knowledge. So nature-based solutions must be inclusive, transparent, developed with respect to land rights and respect to local people's views and the benefits should equally be distributed. In that regard, you can also take a look at the IUCN MBS uh, guide, which I've also referenced on this slide, which will, of course, be shared with you all, uh, after this, uh, this webinar. And you might be asking yourself, how does that then look like within uh, our certification? So in that regard, I just wanted to share uh, our approach, our current approach in our uh, B impact assessment. Uh, which rewards and incentivizes companies who use offsets or credits. Uh, but our, it's good to mention that our current standard does not give a clear imperative of what should be prioritized, meaning emission reduction versus uh, offsetting. However, as you might be aware, uh, we are currently revamping our standards as we actually do once every few years. So we're currently in a consultation process and we have now uh, developed uh, our new draft uh, performance standards, uh, which will uh, go into force uh, in 2024. And in our new performance standards, the emphasis is on emission reduction, obviously. So credits would only account for the residual emissions. And for most companies, this means that uh, this uh, will be uh, around below 10% of, of, of its total emissions. In addition, companies are encouraged uh, to, and actually large enterprises are forced to, uh, take climate uh, action for the wider society, as I just touched upon before, as, and especially around uh, topics of uh, climate justice and just transition. And the form of that can be in credit, uh, credits, but it's not limited uh, to that. So in short, uh, we are uh, seeing uh, increasing as, uh, 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 strict uh, standards, and that's also why we are taking them into account in our new uh, in our new upcoming performance standards. So this is actually what I want to share in terms of uh, what our position is here at BLab. Of course, if you have any questions, feel free to uh, drop them in the chat uh, because we will now start with uh, the Q and A part of this uh, this webinar. Uh, and if you have more let's say, uh, standard-specific questions on the, the on, on B Corp, also feel free to email me uh, directly. Uh, so I will make sure to drop my email address uh, in the chat as well. But uh, I would love now to uh, go back to you, Luke. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Dan. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Um, so yeah, now we've, we've moved on to the, the Q&A part. Um, so I've been sort of jotting down um, some questions. So Miriam, there's a question to you, um, which yes. is, um, how are you dealing with the certification in terms of monitoring verification reports for carbon credits issuance? So after how many years of planting do you start the monitoring? And then what's the frequency that you carry out monitoring and, and audits? Um, so in terms of issuance, we're expecting to do the first issuance after three to five years uh, when the trees are big enough to, uh, to be measured. Um, but monitoring already starts right after implementation. Um, we're doing yeah, different types of monitoring, some on a daily basis, monthly or yearly basis. Um, and to give you some examples, so the daily monitoring involves um, our local workers to check the fences that no livestock is entering our, our areas and trampling our tree seedlings. Um, and then we're also doing seedling survival monitoring. Um, after uh, three months after planting, um, we also do that on a regular basis to, um, if necessary, do replanting. Um, and then what else do we have? Yeah, the measuring the, the carbon, as I said, um, happens when, when the trees are big enough <laughs> to actually to be measured. Yeah. And it's every how many years, sorry, in terms of repeated activity from a yearly basis from, from yeah. certification perspective yeah so at, um we the first time after three to five years and then every five years we will do the issuances that's the plan okay um then jacob i've got quite a short question for you we, we highlighted one of the projects um that the, the, the green branch develops someone has asked who owns the land area that is being afforested 
Well, I think you might be on mute. <laughs> yeah, I'm on mute. Um, yeah, this differs per, per project. Uh, there's there's a lot of different types. Uh, so there is uh, where I do it on governmental land. Uh, we do it in partnerships, uh, but also some areas that that can be acquired by uh, by a fund that is dedicated to to restore uh, forests. So this is uh, but this this differs per region, per country, per, per project. Okay, uh, super clear. Um, then I'm going to go to you, Dan. Um, I've got a question here. It says, how does B-Lab incentivize companies who offset their carbon emissions? Oh, I think you're on mute as well. Yeah, sorry. But the, the, for me, the question was a bit, a bit fake. So incentivize to do what exactly? Because the question is incentivize to reduce. So I think it, it, it might refer to maybe... Um, one of the parts it says rewards and incentivize companies who use offsets and credits in one of your slides. And then the yeah. question says, how will B-Lab? So I think it's asking maybe a bit more detail on that. Yeah, so um, so it's good to know and it's good to mention that uh, we have the B-Impact Assessment tool. So this is a, a tool which then allocates points to a specific impact pillar. Uh, and uh, to receive those uh, points, you have to uh, fill in questions on a specific topic. So, uh, some uh, a very important uh, part of the BIA is focused on on that on that on that part. So, uh, you basically receive points for adhering to these standards or not. And if you don't adhere to these standards, uh, it is uh, way more difficult to, to, to certify. So that's uh, how we try to really uh, encourage companies to, to take that into account. Uh, and that's how we reward and incentivize companies to uh, use offsets uh, or credits. And of course, it's, as I mentioned, in our new performance standards, this will be even taken into a more stringent uh, approach. Uh, really forcing companies to uh, first focus on reduction and then as a second element, of course, also uh, take other elements into account like uh, like, like uh, offsetting. Super clear. Okay. Um, Miriam, I'm going to go back to you now. I've got a question um, that says, planting trees is very different from planting forests. How to include all aspects of biodiversity in reforestations? <laughs> Yeah, that's a very important question. Um, and yeah, as we already uh, mentioned before, um, we are really trying to to plant resilient forests that uh, that resemble the native ecosystem as good as possible. Um, and for that, we're working together with local forest consultants, also the universities that already did research on that. Um, and we're selecting nurseries that, that really grow those seedlings from the region that actually are the best fit. So we're trying our best to resemble native ecosystems and therefore um, hope to have the best impact on, on the local biodiversity too. Okay, uh -huh. thank you. Um, and Jacob, um, I had a question here that was highlighting that um, from Belen saying that their organization is already um, carbon positive um, and how do you how do you see this within the market? And what's your what your view on organisations that are carbon positive? I hope you pick this question because I think it's a very good one, and uh, you're doing a great job there in Argentina with already being carbon neutral and and being carbon positive. Um, I think it's it's again the responsibility for every company what they can do in their power to 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 offset. Uh, but if we look at the future, I think there will be incentives. From on governmental level to 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 be carbon positive. If you uh, well, I spoke about financial reporting. There's uh, other types of reporting coming in. I think a next step will be that there is uh, well tax systems that that can incentivize companies to to work towards these kind of uh, uh, well, strategies. Of course, this is an expectation. It is not something set in stone. But uh, yeah. okay. Um, and, and I'm going to move across to, to Miriam now. We had a question that, that highlights, how do you engage local stakeholders in your projects? Um, so we're looking at uh, main organizations operating in the area, uh, talking to those going kind of from top to bottom. Um, and then um, via those uh, doing kind of snowballing um, and doing stakeholder mapping. Um, to then also go down to the households and doing household service. So we're trying to, uh, yeah, to integrate everyone in the best way possible. Yeah, also having like meetings where we invite everybody uh, to present about our 
present our project and also discuss with them, get their feedback. Um, so our doors are always open um, and I think, and hope that we're communicating that in the right way. Brilliant. Um, and Jacob, tough question for you. Um, we've had a question from James that says, can a growing business achieve net zero by reducing the carbon intensity of products? Um, so, you know, as it gets bigger, how can it how can it deal with what we're talking about today or how can it get involved in the strategy of, of, of net zero strategy even if it's if it's growing yeah so how, how to make claims about this is this is a kind of a complex question uh and uh regulations like sbti have uh, ways to do so um but there's definitely ways to at the one hand increase your uh well grow your company on the other hand also take responsibility in the west way you can uh, but this is, of course, a bit more complex than uh, than having a uh, well mature company. Okay, I've had um, so Jacob, I'm going to stick with you. I've had like two questions that are quite similar, um, yeah. asking about. So someone was talking about what about rest of uh, reforestation programs or regeneration programs in Europe, um, and particularly Belgium. Um, and and what, what can you say about that from a Europe perspective? But also someone's asked the question, which geographical regions are best for, for reforestation? So keen to get your opinion on that. Okay. Um, so yeah, there's there's a lot of difficulties here. And this is also why we should not treat uh, carbon as a commodity because there's different costs and different aspects of every, every project that there is, but uh, we should restore everywhere. Um, I think, if you look at the best possible regions in terms of carbon growth, well, you have, of course, the, the uh, belt um, like Indonesia, Central Africa, and also uh, Brazil, where there is a, well, the climate is very good to do such projects. And I'm meaning the climate as in uh, carbon levels are used for a lot of carbon per, per year. Um, so that's why it's more difficult, for example, in Belgium or, or the Netherlands to plant trees because, well, Prices of land are higher, uh, and also the the uh, carbon uptake is is lower. Um, so this is something that is uh, at this point very difficult, and uh, I think uh, also a midterm uh, challenge that we have to overcome as a market. Okay, um, I think I'm going to do, got time for just maybe two more questions or one more question. So we'll start with this one. So Miriam, this one's for you. We've got a question about leakage. Um, so where where um, ARR happens in place where cattle grazing is the baseline. How is leakage monitored, considering that people may have to move their animals somewhere else with potentially reduced space? And how is this monitored over time? Um, so in our case of our project, uh, we're working together with big landowners that own multiple farms. Um, and it was the it was this way that the landowner took the cattle, part of the cattle he took and replaced to an already existing cattle ranch. Um, and when we talk about cattle ranches in Brazil, they are huge. Like the one that we um, now planted was 2,500 hectares, I think. Um, uh, so there's enough space for the cattle also on the other farm. And part of the cattle was brought to the slaughterhouse. Um, so we're in, well informed about those processes. That's also super important for the certification itself, that we are aware of what happens to the cattle and that we are reporting and monitoring the leakage. Um, so we are in touch with the landowner and we are uh, we have yeah, reported and documented evidence for, for what happens to it too, yeah. Okay, then I'm gonna, um, last question, Jacob, to you. Um, someone has asked that the costs associated with registering, validating and verifying projects in the voluntary carbon market is a major barrier to smaller scale projects. How can you get around this issue? Yes, it is, and um, that's very difficult as well for us in the beginning because you have to do a project at skill already uh what we do know is that i think with the uh with the new innovations okay you guys yeah look are we yeah we can still hear you yeah so there's hello yeah we can we can hear you okay uh, my uh, my screen went on black um so <laughs> No, this this is there was a, this is an issue as to, uh, and was also when we started the, the project, uh, we had to do that skill from the beginning was also was a good thing of course, um, but there there's there's uh, movements on the market so I think what will lower the cost of such projects uh, tremendously is when we introduce the use of technology. Now everything is done uh, with field measurements. That's also 
of course, a good sign of quality because you get checked on in person. Uh, but we can also be more efficient here if we adapt technology in the certification process. Uh, other things is that there's also other certifications coming up, like Plan Vivo that they're designing uh, project for uh, project designs for smaller projects. Um, so I think time will will solve this as well. Um, but it's still uh, something difficult. Yeah. Okay. Well, look, unfortunately, we, we've got very little time left. Um, so what we do, we we have recorded this session. Um, so we're going to share the recording with those that have participated. And I've noticed there's a couple of questions that we haven't had time to answer. So in our communication back to you, we'll make sure that we give the Green Branch view on some of these questions. Um, but for now, nothing else to say, but thank you very much for joining. If you have um, any follow-up questions that you didn't put in the chat or would like to get in touch with the Green Branch, uh, my details are here. So l.james at thegreenbranch.nl. So please get in touch. We'd, we'd love to hear from you. Um, but yeah, nothing else to say, but thank you very much uh, for Dan for joining us and then our speakers, Miriam and Jacob. Uh, and there, I'll close it down there. Thank you so much.